Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. Um, well, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight is part four of a sutra that we've been working on now for a few Sundays called in Sanskrit. It's called the Vidya Prapta Paripricha Sutra, the Sutra of Bodhisattva Lightning Obtainer. And it's also called in the sort of the Chinese edition that a lot of us are using, or at least the English translation of the Chinese edition. It's called the Inexhaustible Hidden Treasury Sutra. Uh, so that's fun. Uh, since this is part four, I'm going to dispense with a lot of, you know, summarizing and all that. You can certainly go back and check out parts one, two, and three. Um, tonight's a fun night. It's one of those nights that where I, an hour and a half, an hour and a half is really not quite enough time. So this might be a little bit of a freight train. Um, so please, at any point, like pull the whistle on me if you have questions or comments or ideas. Otherwise, I'm going to be speeding pretty uh, full speed ahead um, with this part four where, um, well, where you can see a lot has happened since we've last been here. Uh, our hero, Bodhisattva Vijaprapta, has transformed into some kind of pyramid-esque uh, shape. But before he did that, Bodhisattva Vijaprapta Lightning Attainer had asked the Buddha, who was chilling on the vulture's peak, Mount Gridrakuta, um, had asked the Buddha his paripricha, his questions. And the question was basically, how do, how do Bodhisattvas, what are the practices of the Bodhisattva? What does the Bodhisattva do? How do they do it? How do they do it so well? And in this particular sutra, the Buddha's answer is quite interesting. He says, well, Vijaprapta Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva has five hidden treasuries. The treasury of desire, anger, and delusion. Those are the three kleshas, the three defilements. And then a fourth treasury of an equal portion, desire, anger, and delusion. And then a fifth treasury of all the dharmas. And we have thus far opened up the treasury of the practices of desire to learn as bodhisattvas in training, to learn how to deal with desire. <laughs> That was the idea, how to deal with desire. You could interpret it as your own desire. You could interpret it as encountering very desirous people. In particular, the first treasury here was sort of dealing with people, again, one, oneself or others, who are sort of desire obsessed. You know, they might be the friendliest person in the world. They might actually have a head in those shoulders, like really, you know, really sharp, really clued in. But man, just ravenous, ravenous desire. And this desire could be for all kinds of things, food or whatever, pleasures. But of course, the sutra dealt with the, the pinnacle of desire, sexuality, sexual gratification, that, that thing called sex. Then we learned about dealing with, okay, let's say somebody was not so desireful also had a head on their shoulders, but wow, quite the temper, just a real, you know, anger filled. So we learned how to handle the anger filled sentient beings. And last time we also learned how to deal with the deluded, the really self-involved, as the sutra said, wrapped like a, cocoon, a cocoon in their own delusion. How do you penetrate the walls of delusion? So that's what we got into last time. If those sound interesting and you hadn't checked it out, go check it out. Otherwise, tonight we are opening up the fourth treasury, the fourth hidden treasury, the Bu Garba, the Fu Zhang, these hidden treasuries. The fourth one, which is actually sort of 
an equal mix of desire, anger, and delusion, right? So that's where we're going to dive in. Tonight is filled with all kinds of things, ideas, stories, metaphors, parables. I got props, everything. So, so hold on to your hats and glasses for part four of the Vijipata Paripicha Sutra. Uh, I'm on page 156 of the Chang translation if you're reading at home. And now, Vijaprapta, what, what is meant by the Bodhisattva's hidden treasury uh, for those afflicted with equally by all three defilements? Greed, hatred, and delusion. Desire, anger, and delusion. As an illustration, consider a clean crystal clear mirror with four facets, a four-sided mirror. When placed at the crossing of two thoroughfares, it gives a true image of everything around it, but it does not think of itself as being able to produce these images, which are naturally reflected on it when it is well polished. Um, that's it. That's the analogy, right? Yeah, I'm not even going to, in the same way, Bodhisattvas, but hold on. We got to understand the, <laughs> we got to understand what's going on here before we understand how it is that the Bodhisattva is like a four faceted, clearly polished mirror. So my prop that I brought in is actually something a little closer to what the sutra says. So the Chinese actually says a mirror-like disc. And it actually says that there is a four so like a four-sided mirror-like disc. Okay, so first of all, let's get into that. I drew this pyramid type thing for a reason. We'll get, we'll get into that later. But I wanted you to know that the original Chinese is actually this word, a disc. And so, oh man, talk about not enough time already. This part of the sutra is, it's juicy. It's so juicy. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, like a quadruple layered upside down Dharma cake. It has so many layers to it that it's, it's wild. It's wild how many layers are baked into this thing. And so, for example, this is going to be talking about a, these four mirror-like discs. That is very reminiscent of the elemental discs of air, water, fire, and earth that create the world. So that's just in the background, just chilling in the background is we're going to replace the four great elements with these mirror-like discs. And so before I can like get into this idea of how a bodhisattva might be like that, we need to, and I'm sorry, I had it the wrong way. We need to reflect, we need to reflect on the nature of the mirror-like surface, right? So I don't, I don't know about you, but like I have this, I don't even know why. Like, why do I think the surface of a mirror is silver? It has no color. It is whatever color is being presented by it, right? The idea is, is that the idea, the, what's so beautiful about the surface of a mirror, right, is that it is whatever color, shape, size, or number that's being reflected in it, right? And so one really heavy meditation, of course, is being like, oh, look, there's everybody. There's everybody in the surface of a mirror, right? Oh my gosh, look, there's everybody in the surface of a mirror, in the surface of a mirror, right? But the, the idea here is, is, is how many, how many little zoom windows 
right? Well, you, your mind could chop up the surface of the mirror as much as it wants. And there's a way of seeing the surface of a mirror as a monolithic whole. As I, it's, a, it's a term I throw around a lot, monolithic whole. Well, the surface of a mirror is like a monolithic whole. In fact, it's even weirder than a monolithic whole, right? That it kind of has no color or anything like that. In fact, it, it's just whatever is in front of it in that way. That meditation on the weird nature of the surface of a mirror and the way that you could gaze into it and sort of divide it up as much as you want, or you could see it all as a singular. Well, yeah, that's just happening on the visual front when you're looking in a mirror. Imagine some sort of weird six media mirror where there's a reflection game going on in the same way, but auditorily like echoes, olfactorily, right? And on and on. So that is sort of the Dharma Dhatu reminder. And the analogy in this one is that it's like the surface of a mirror. And that's an amazing thing to think about when you're trying to think about the nature of the Dharma Dhatu or the realm of reality. This says, as an illustration, it's like a four-sided mirror put at a great thoroughfare. <laughs> and that basically, if you're coming down the thoroughfare, right, of delusion, <laughs> you're going to be staring at this mirror and of delusion in a way. That, and what the, well, now I, now I can introduce the, 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 the bodhisattva is like this. The bodhisattva, Vijaprapta, is like this great mirror. Because in the same way, when bodhisattvas have polished the mirror of the Dharma Dhatu, they abide in effortless samadhi and teach hundreds of thousands of doctrines in accordance with the different mentalities of sentient beings so that they may gain a thorough understanding of all these doctrines and attain liberation. However, those bodhisattvas do not conceive any notions of dharmas or sentient beings. <clears throat> and why is this? because bodhisattvas have insight into the nature of the Dharma Dhatu, the realm of reality. They know the real situation of sentient beings who are prone to the four defiled states of mind. And, teach, and bodhisattvas teach them the Dharma according to their various inclinations. Yet, in accordance with reality, those bodhisattvas view dharmas and sentient beings non-dualistically, clearly seeing that there are no differences among them. So that's the first analogy that in, in sort of this hidden treasury of dealing with all afflictions, the bodhisattva is like a well-polished surface of a mirror responding immediately to the situation, not with some tired old rehearsed Dharma speech you've heard a million times and well, this and that, but actually being so polished that they're, they're like re so responsive to the situation. So again, this is sort of fourth, we're fourth lesson here. So we already know that we have been, we have been learning these practices in this way of like um, um, developing sentient beings, as it might be called. I've just been saying dealing, dealing with sentient beings, kind of like being in the world. Cause right. Cause we know this about the Bodhisattva path. We're not necessarily on the mountaintop. We're, potentially in the city, and actually we're coming up on a great description of that. So unless you have any questions about the surface of a mirror, <laughs> I'm going to move it along because, again, there's a bunch of stuff. There's so many beautiful things. And so Vijaprapta, just as one sees in Akasha space, no distinguishable 
characteristics, lakshana, or constructions. So bodhisattvas who observe the Dharma Dhatu well realize that all dharmas are one. Due to the power of their past vows, they can explain dharma in many ways according to sentient beings' propensities, while making no distinctions among the mirror-like surface of the well-polished Dharma Dhatu. Vijaprapta. Bodhisattvas have clear insight into all the 21,000 actions of those afflicted equally by all three defilements, as well as other wrong actions in all 84,000. And they can teach the Dharma in different ways by means of effortless wisdom just as good physicians can make proper diagnoses and administer the right medicine for the disease. This is what is meant by a great bodhisattva's hidden treasury for those afflicted equally by all three defilements. Once bodhisattvas have acquired this hidden treasury, they can for a kalpa or more Upayakli, skillfully teach the Dharma to sentient beings in different terms according to their aspirations. Just as sentient beings' wrong actions are boundless, so are the bodhisattvas' wisdom and eloquence. Bodhisattvas who have acquired this hidden treasury for those afflicted equally by all three defilements can, in this manner, skillfully, upayakli teach non-differentiation of the nature of the Dharma Dhatu. All right. Oh no, let's keep going because I'll get to the part that I was almost about to get to, which is to say, furthermore, Vijaprapta, when bodhisattvas achieve such wisdom as realized by this hidden treasury for those afflicted by all three defilements, they will, they will thoroughly know the inclinations and wishes of all sentient beings. When they see sentient beings full of desire, they may, to subdue and cure them, appear as ordinary people, afflicted with desires and possessing a spouse, children, property, and the necessities of life. But, they will remain as undefiled as a lotus flower. Some sentient beings who are deluded and lack wisdom cannot understand such a bodhisattva's ingenuity and think, how can a wise person be so greedy to fulfill their desires that they, how can, sorry, this is a weird sentence that I've been having trouble with all day. So these people that see these bodhisattvas who take on just normal appearances as householders, they think, how can a wise person be so greedy to fulfill desires that they are indistinguishable from an ordinary person? And trust me, the Chinese was just as, tr as hard. I was a little... But thus they consider that the bodhisattvas Thus, they consider that bodhisattvas be apart from the pursuit of enlightenment. Doom. Yeah, then it gets crazy. But before it gets crazy, let me make clear what's going on, right? This is sort of doing a Vimalakirti move where out of ingenuity, out of wisdom, the bodhisattva appears, right, as a householder with a spouse, children, property, all the necessities of life but they will remain as undefiled as a lotus flower, right? And that, that analogy of the lotus flower is a very old one, but it, appear, it appears in the Vimalakirti Sutra to illustrate the exact same idea, being kind of in the world, but not of it, as they might say, right? But then these other people see the religious practitioner with a spouse and children, Right? They see this bodhisattva. Yeah, bodhisattva, right? 
They see this bodhisattva and they think, like, how could you do that? How could you be so greedy? Da 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 da, right? And because their minds are impure, they become angry with the bodhisattva and do not respect them or believe in them. Woo! Dude, due to that karma, they, those people will fall to the great hells after death. However, they will be secretly converted by those same bodhisattvas that they derided, and they will without fail realize the equality of all dharmas after the retribution for their misdeeds is completed. <laughs> so, that's a funny little story. Well, it's a funny, not a funny little story, but you, this happens in sutras a lot, which is sort of, you know, woe to those who badmouth the bodhisattva is basically the, me the message that you, you hear a lot. Um, but again, you know, this is totally in keeping in line with the message of the sutra, in particular, this fourth treasury, which is basically like, if, if I may, uh, paraphrase quickly just to bring us up like fully up to speed what this is you know there's this debate about oh no the bodhisattvas were the real forest dwellers no 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 the bodhisattva path is the lay buddhist path like that's for lay people no 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 the bodhisattva path is like tantric sex and you da 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 no and the idea of, of upaya the idea of this is that Bodhisattvas are pretty in ingenious. And the idea is, is that it might make the most sense to wrap themselves in white cloth and, you know, carry one of those uh, whisk, those uh, palm whisks, and like, you know, appear like the holy person that you, you want. They might do that so that you listen to what they have to say because you're you know, they know, the Bodhisattva knows that you might be enchanted by the purity of the white robes and they're like, oh, what is that whisk and all this stuff, right? But the Bodhisattva might also appear as the barmaid, that, that beautiful, wonderful barmaid that protects everybody, that makes sure, makes sure everybody doesn't get blackout drunk and makes sure everybody gets home safe and is in the trenches. That might be the Bodhisattva. Who knows is part of the idea the bodhisattva knows that's the idea right so just so that we're we're you know not getting you know not falling into the trap of the bodhisattva is the householder way no the beauty is is that it, it can be the householder way that's the beauty of it and what's even more beautiful is it doesn't need to be that either and you can get stories of bodhisattvas renouncing and going and living in caves for 10 years because it was upayak for some, you know, for whatever reason. So, questions, comments, answers? Is there, is there like a corollary that anyone you, you happen to meet might be able to teach you something? Yes, apps. I, I definitely believe that's part of what's going on with the bodhisattva being like a mirror. And this idea too, no, in fact, that's a really great observation, a really great I, comment, which is this idea that for, for us learners out in the world, we might want to be careful about that um, because the bodhisattva might be a mirror and if you're, let's see, what, uh, so if anger was red and you're coming down the red brick road of anger, you might encounter somebody that you think is angry yeah. and therefore has nothing to teach you yeah. when really they're just reflecting your own anger and you have a lot to learn from them, right? So awesome, Noam, great. Okay. Yeah, th that's what I mean. This, this all is operating many different ways. We, we are the bodhisattvas, but we are also the great, you know, the humble learners from the bodhisattvas and, you know. Okay, so we really, we're really just getting into this treasury here. This is all sort of been preparatory in that way. 
Um, so the and because the Buddha is so uh, uh, kind and compassionate, he has another example. For, for example, Vijaprapta, just as a raging fire can burn up all the trees and grasses fed into it, turning them all into fire, so Bodhisattva's raging wisdom fire can turn the desire, anger, and delusion of all the sentient beings they encounter into wisdom. Whether those people are good or evil or whatever, this is called the unique quality of a bodhisattva. So that right there, you know, is a, is a that's an interesting analogy. The, the, the raging fire that just can consume everything. And so then the bodhisattva is this raging fire that can consume the world's greed, hatred, and delusion. Wow. But not only that, not only is the bodhisattva so vastly infinite in that well of meta and compassion for the world that they, like a raging fire, can take on all. Not only that, but through this amazing upaya, they are these great, uh, what, uh, mediators or great, uh, great teachers. Because the idea is, is that even to the most angry person, the bodhisattva in that great reflective wisdom that just fully knows the minds of sentient beings because they're so reflectively pure in their own mind, that bodhisattva can not only tolerate the greatest anger, but flip it, turn it into a teaching that then actually enlightens that person where they, they cease being angry. Wow. Wow. Really? Tell me more. Tell me more, Buddha. Well, as a further illustration, consider the majestic, the great Mount Sumeru, which has unique attributes. Each of its four sides is made of a different kind of jewel and sentient beings at the base. Whether the jewels are blue, yellow, red, or white, all assume the color of lapis lazuli when they draw near. Oh, sorry, no, that was about the people. That was, this is a, uh, uh, wow, yeah, they're talking about the people. Sentient beings, blue, yet, blue, yellow, red, white, <laughs> all assume the color of lapis lazuli when they draw near to the side made up of lapis lazuli. They all turn gold when they approach the side of gold. They all turn silver when they approach the side of silver. In the same way, if bodhisattvas have this unique quality, then sentient beings whether they are desire-filled, anger-filled, or deluded, whether they're good or evil, they will acquire the wisdom of a bodhisattva by associating with these bodhisattvas that have this unique quality. Some of these beings, because of their impure minds and evil deeds, may still fall into the hell realms or the realm of hungry ghosts or the realm of animals or even the realm of yama, Yet after the retribution for their misdeeds, they will attain supreme unsurpassable enlightenment without fail by virtue of, bodhis of these bodhisattvas' unique merit and the power of their past vows. Yeah? Very good. I had a question. <clears throat> Rocket Jaswell. Um, how long, how long, how long do you wait for a bodhisattva to do that? Like if they're, in front, or how do before, you know? you, before you realize, like, are they for real or not? Is, mm. is, there, is there a concept of time in this, this kind of <laughs> huh. um, Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I, I actually think only the bodhisattva knows. 
<laughs> because of this idea of upaya, Jaswal, this idea that the exact nature of these things is not fixed, like the, like the surface of a mirror, we, that we do not know in that way. So may, maybe it's wise to pretend that the, the person in front of you is a bodhisattva, and is that? That's the practice. Okay. Not even the Bodhisattva, but the Buddha, the fully enlightened, your fully enlightened teacher in a way. Mm. And if I may, Jaswal, on that note, just because that can sound a little like, whoa, and that is a little whoa, there is a great saying of Confucius, and I'm not the type of guy to quote Confucius a lot, <laughs> but every now and then a good Confucian quote isn't, you know, it, it's worthwhile. Confucius said, Make the wise man your teacher and the fool your lesson. The teaching or the meaning of that, of course, is that we have something to learn from everybody. And so if they are really, really smart, enlightened people, then you sit at their feet and you, you learn. And if they're an utter fool being a total jerk, you learn from that too meaning you see how it's other people around them are responding you learn so everybody is is a teacher in that way so question michael yo um the the wisdom that we're talking about i i assume it's sort of the the general broad scope of wisdom uh, but I'm kind of hearing maybe different things. One is uh, like this w wisdom of I can like see what other people are thinking. Like I know everything that's happening with these people. I know how to play, you know, like play these people and, you know, or is it more, is it more of a non delusion thing? Like I've, I've gotten rid of all delusions I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out, is it the perception or is it the, the non-delusion or is it, is it both that would be encompassed in this wisdom that we're talking about? You mean the fire wisdom, Dean? You're talking the about fire. The fire yeah. wisdom? Yes. There's this, great, there's this great term in the text and it's in Chinese. It's fire wisdom. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you asked that question. We, we reached a point in the text where it said, when bodhisattvas achieve this, the wisdom, the wisdom, they will thoroughly know the inclinations and wishes of sentient beings. And so we actually reach a point in the progression of our story here where this is the moment. This is the moment where, if, oh, if you, if you get this one, now you can kind of, know the minds and inclinations of all sentient beings. And I, I mentioned this one night and it's very, very well worth repeating. I said this, that about like this idea that bodhisattvas can like read people's minds or even that it's a siddhi, a supernormal power to be able to have telepathy or read others' minds. And then why the bodhisattva is so cool is he uses that superpower for good instead of evil and he uses it to teach people. And that night that I talked about this, I tried or I wanted to make it clear that the way that I understand this is that when we're talking about the Dharma Dattu, the realm of reality, the realm of dharmas, mm -hmm. when the Bodhisattva is really tapped into a knowledge of what's going on here, meaning all sentient beings' actions are driven by greed, anger, and delusion. Wanting, not wanting, and being confused. It's actually quite simple. And so knowing the minds and inclinations of sentient beings is actually knowing your own mind. Because you're a sentient being too. And so knowing how minds operate is what allows the bodhisattva to quote know the minds of all sentient beings and what of course what i'm getting at is that this is not some sort of like 
magic trick, like what card am I holding up? I can read your mind stuff. It's actually more, well, I don't want to just put it as body language and things like that. It's much more than that. It's much, much deeper than just body language and things, but it's about understanding that why I'm even doing this is because I want to in a set, like even my actions are being driven by these three, three, and you could fully understand my mind and why I'm saying and doing everything I'm doing because it's, it's because of this. Yeah. It seems like almost a, a psychologist who's, who knows how to, to read all these little cues from people. Okay. Yep. And it's not some sort of, again, magic trick where I'm penetrating your brain and I got Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink thing and I'm like, in there. It's not that. <laughs> Thank you. Yo. Okay, so this is a great moment. We're about to take a crazy, like, uh, sidestep. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to alarm anybody. I don't want to frighten anybody. And I just, I don't want, I, you know, I just don't want you to be let down. But, you know, here's how it goes, folks. So if you have the good old, a treasury of Mahayana sutras, and you're on page 158, and you've been reading along, and you get to the point that we're at right here, where it's like, and we, you know, all those people will attain enlightenment without fail by virtue of that bodhisattva's great merit and past vows. Dot, dot, dot. And then it begins, right? The next paragraph, right? So those are called uh, ellipses, right? And this, uh, again, I don't, I'm sorry to be the, 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 the bearer of bad news here, but this is a this is a uh, uh, this is a an abuse, folks. This is an abuse of ellipses. There, I said it. If you if you're like me, and you're in you're into the Tai Show, you're into the 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 Chinese canon, and you're like, oh wow, uh, ellipses, right? That's like there's a little bit more there, right? Yeah, there's a lot more there. There's pages actually that they just decided to put three dots. And you get to things like that and you start to worry. <laughs> you start to worry because you think, you know, somebody, you know, it's published, it has footnotes and these very careful footnotes where they're like, oh, by the way, right here, right, right here, there's, we, we switch these words, but we're letting you know about it. We're letting you know about it with a footnote. It's that important that we switch these words, but we're not going to make any mention of the fact that, that there's an entire story about a monk named Vimala. Wow, his name's Vimala? Really? I'm, you know me, folks. I am fascinated by this idea of Vimala. And so when I start to read ahead, and I'm like, wait a minute, where's this? There's this whole crazy story, which, you know, my Chinese isn't the best in the world. So, but it's a really funny story about this monk named Vimala. And he was being, and there's a king, and there's all this stuff that happens. And to illustrate that story that I'm not going to tell you because I don't have the, the full comprehension of it yet, so I wouldn't dare do that. It's only after that as an illustration that the Buddha says, Vijaprapta, just as of all mountains, Mount Maru is the highest. So of all kinds of wisdom, the Tathagatas, the Buddhas, is supreme. But that story is actually about this king and Mount Maru is the king of mountains and it's about this monk teaching this king. Uh, so there, it's interesting that it's, um, well, all I have to say is, is that the next time you see three little dots in this book, take it with a big grain of salt, okay? And someday I'll get back to you about what that story was about. So I just needed to take that scholarly sidestep to let everybody know what was going on there. But if we keep moving ahead, Vijaprapta, just as all of the, just as of all mountains, Mount Sumeru is the highest. So of all kinds of wisdom, the Tathagata, 
is the supreme. Just as of all bodies of water, the ocean is the deepest, so of all kinds of wisdom, the Tathagatas is the most profound. Just as of all monarchs, the universal monarch is the most honored, so of all kinds of wisdom, the Tathagatas is the highest. Vijaprapta, because the Tathagata has achieved this kind of wisdom, he can thoroughly understand the desire, anger, and delusion of sentient beings and every shift in their minds. He comprehends all these in an instant. Vijaprapta, the Tathagata who has achieved all knowing wisdom, resembles someone who has clear sight. Just as such a person with good vision can effortlessly see with unquestionable clarity five mangoes held in their hand, so the Tathagata can see the mental activities of all beings and give appropriate discourses on the Dharma to those assemblies. By the way, the text just says one mango. The Chinese, it's five mangoes. And I believe that's another sad uh, omission because the five mangoes, I believe, are a reference to the five skandhas. You see this in other sutras too. And the idea of being able to see it is clearly in your own hand. That idea of having the same vision of something in your hand as like the whole universe or whole world that's sort of a thing that happens with Buddha wisdom or Tathagata knowledge, that it's, it's almost like standing, you know, with this kind of Buddha's eye view of the whole world or something, right? So just a note about that, about the mangoes. In the immeasurable, countless Buddha lands, there are sentient beings who are prone to desire, who are inflamed with and perturbed by desire, who waste their time day and night thinking of methods to gratis, gratify their desire, and who create different bodily and verbal karmas because of this burning desire. All this the Tathagata knows and sees. There are sentient beings who are smothered with anger and hatred, who bear grudges against one another, who will fall to the uninterrupted hell because of their malice. All of this the Tathagata knows and sees. There are sentient beings who are prone to delusion, who are shrouded in ignorance, confused, obdurate, and who delight in following wrong views. All this the Tathagata knows and sees. Some sentient beings are competent, some incompetent, some advanced, some regressing. Some have cultivated good roots for the Tathagata way or the Tathagata vehicle. Some have cultivated good roots for the Shravaka vehicle. And some have cultivated good roots for the Pratekya vehicle. All this the Tathagata knows and sees. Because the Tathagata has achieved this rare kind of wisdom, he is able to know the different mentalities of sentient beings in an assembly. When it is untimely to preach, he will remain silent and merely think, these sentient beings are confused about dharmas and cannot understand my teaching right now. <laughs> because the Tathagata is equipped with supreme power and a skillful sense of timing, he thoroughly knows who can be subdued who has high aspirations, who is endowed with patience, and who can accept criticism. Knowing this, the, the Tathagata wins people over to the Dharma accordingly and benefits them. Dot, dot, dot. That one's a slightly smaller ellipse, by the way, not a whole story that's, that we're missing. And when bodhisattvas see desire-filled beings, they should think, it's my fault that they are so inflamed with desire. When the bodhisattvas see sentient beings inflamed with anger or foolish delusions, 
they should also think this is my fault and why it's my duty to find medicine and ways to heal six sentient beings when i see them i vowed to relieve them from these their, their desires but now they're sick i must have forsaken them so i am to blame Vijaprapta, if bodhisattvas achieve such a mental state as that, reflecting on their own faults and feeling great kindness towards sentient beings, they will never take revenge on their offenders, even if they dismember their bodies bit by bit. Vijaprapta, if bodhisattvas thus engage in right practice, their past unwholesome karmas will be eradicated completely and no evil will arise in them in the future. Okay. So we're doing pretty good on time. We're almost at like the... We're almost at the story. This has actually all been building up to the grand illustration. <laughs> so unless there's any questions, comments or ideas so far, if anybody's sort of a little confused about anything, now would be a great time. And not that you can't jump in <laughs> in a few minutes, but. Okay, um, I wanted to make one comment about that last part before we move ahead this idea that when bodhisattvas see angrier desire filled beings they think it's my fault i made a vow to save all sentient beings i must have let them down somehow um that's a really tricky teaching you know this comes very late in the sutra i i prefaced this sutra by saying Vijaprapta is a very advanced bodhisattva at the beginning of the sutra. He's advanced and then is asking about some pretty advanced stuff. And so this teaching needs to be taken like, well, it just has to be taken in context. It's a very powerful teaching, this idea of, of looking basically at the faults of others as one's own shortcoming in a way. And there's a lot of problems with that if you're not a bodhisattva. There's a lot of problems with that if you're not a fourth stage, high level bodhisattva, deeply engaged in the practice of metta, karuna, and this stuff. So, you know, this teaching about like seeing other people's faults and then being like, oh, that must be my fault. Again, that's dangerous you know, any good, you know, any psychiatrist or psychologist would steer you clearly away from thinking that way. And I would agree with them if it would, if this wasn't in context of the Bodhisattva practice. And so, yeah, there's, there's a really deep teaching here that I don't have time to make because of the story but it's actually about, and, and if you've been studying with me for a while or you've listened to my talks, I've said this before, so you, you, know, you know this idea, but it's about at a very deep level of this Dharma Dhatu reality, it's about the very, very nature of these sentient beings I'm encountering and the possibility, the, the high possibility that, that that we are all like facets of one consciousness are all fractals of one consciousness. And so we are all deeply bound up together in a really deep way. And so if somebody else's mind is all screwed up with anger, there is a sort of a very deep way in which one's own mind is screwed up as well. And so there's a, it is your fault. But again, I, don't, I want to avoid this problem language of fault and blame because it's not what this is talking about. This is talking about a really, really big-hearted Mother Teresa-style bodhisattva that's like, 
so compassionate towards even angry people that they're like, oh, wow, what did I do? I let these people down. I got I to gotta help them out. So I just want to make that clear that, that this is a, a tricky teaching, so keep it in context. And, you know, a, a, re, a related teaching to this, and it's a related teaching to the whole theme of tonight, which is this, uh, you know, an, an, uh, from, a, from another, uh, a different spiritual tradition, this, this enlightened sage Jesus, who said something about before you go pointing out the little speck of dust in somebody else's eye, you might want to check out the big log that's lodged into your own eye. <laughs> uh, that's something like that. This is very similar to that idea about you know being a mirror <laughs> reflecting reality and then sort of being like you know maybe this anger that's coming at me has something to do with me <laughs> type of a situation so everybody okay on that that was more for you know posterity i know everybody in the zoom room is on that same page it's worth saying okay so now this was all preliminary. Now we get to go to a Buddha land. Everybody likes to go to a Buddha land. Um, so let's go. Vijipapta. Numberless, incalculable kalpas ago, eons and eons ago. Bef even before the era of the lamp lighting Buddha, Dipankara. There was a Buddha named Tathagata, born victorious. The worthy one, the supremely enlightened one, the one perfect in learning and conduct, the well-gone one, the world knower, the unexcelled one, the great tamer, the teacher of gods and humans, the Buddha, the world-honored one. She was born in a world named Brilliant Light and lived in a forest near the capital city, Secure Peace. Uh, by the way, this isn't the first time we've been to this Buddha land either. In the, or if you've been coming to the Dharma doors, this world called Bright, or brilliantly bright, brilliant light. This was in our, uh, I believe our Ashoka Data Sutra at a certain point, we went to this Buddha land, right? And because of the Ashoka Data Sutra and the nature of that Sutra, very feminine, and the whole Buddha land bright was very feminine. I'm, I'm gonna go to stick with the, the female pronoun here for this Tathagata. I think it's the right thing to do. And so in that world bright, where Tathagata, born winning, always winning, born, victor born victorious, at that time in that world, bright, brilliant light, there was a ferocious, bloodthirsty, irritable, merciless butcher named Horrible. <clears throat> whose hands were always smeared with blood, making a fearful sight. By the way, this is a chandala. This is a, <clears throat> this word I have up here, chandala. It's what they're translating as a butcher, but a chandala is like a, ch chandala it seems to be a pretty like vicious, like it's not like they were a butcher, meaning like you, you want a T-bone? You want a T-bone? Like, not that kind of butcher. I'm talking like Jeffrey Dahmer type butcher. Scary, scary dude whose name was horrible. Once the Chandala, Chandala entered his house to kill a cow tied there. The cow, seeing him, became frightened and dashed out towards the forest where the Tathagata, born victorious, lived dragging the ropes behind it. While the butcher, knife in hand, was chasing it, the cow panicked and fell into a deep pit. 
Knowing death was near, the cow moaned and bellowed in agony. At the sight of the cow, the butcher flew into a rage and immediately jumped into the pit to kill the cow with the knife. Just at that time, Tathagata born victorious, surrounded by a huge assembly of numberless hundreds of thousands of devotees, was expounding the doctrine of Pratitya Samudpata, dependent origination, in detail, as follows. It is upon ignorance that actions depend. On actions depend consciousness. On consciousness depend name and form. On name and form depend the six sense organs. On the six sense organs depend contact. On contact depends vidanas, feeling or sensations. On feeling or sensations depends craving. On craving does depend grasping. On grasping does depend becoming on becoming depends birth, on birth depends old age, death, worry, sorrow, misery, and distress. Every link of dependent origination is only a great mass of suffering. Okay, I'm actually gonna pause there and do a quick Dharma talk on the 12 link chain of causation. So, be, you know, I'm going to play the role. I'll play the role of born victorious, right? And I'll do my Dharma talk. So if you don't know, uh, this, these are the so-called 12 links in the chain of causation. And this is usually presented in a mandala, in a circle, so that in a way, no link in the chain takes priority over the other, right? You could kind of start anywhere in the 12 links and start going around. This is a helpful in terms of this uh, idea of this mass of suffering. It's kind of actually helpful to do it this way. It's also helpful to do it this way, stacked linearly or stacked, not linearly, but stacked laterally, I guess, or whatever. Vertically, stacked vertically. Doing it this way helps with the idea of the dependent nature of each, that the one above it depends on the other, right? So let me, just because if, if this is your first time hearing all of this, this idea of dependent origination and the 12 links of dependent origination, I just want to show you how easy it is. It's so easy. So... These, and should I do that? Real quick, if you didn't know, the, the problem is, is ignorance, delusion, confusion, ignorance, avidya. This is the problem. It's why we're working on all this, getting our minds straight, Dharma stuff. Because the problem is, is that we're a little confused. We're not totally clear about what's going on here. That's ignorance. It is upon that ignorance that what the text calls actions, but it's actually samskara, what I translate as conditioning, our conditioned habits depend on our deluded thoughts. The idea is, is that we got it wrong the first time and then we did it again. <laughs> And, and are, are conditioning that wrong idea. Um, money's going to bring me happiness. Well, maybe it will this time. <laughs> oh, maybe this time. Maybe this time. Maybe this time. Maybe this time. And so the conditioning of the notion that money will bring happiness is dependent upon ignorance. It is upon our ignorance that our samskara or our conditioning depends. That conditioning 
is what our thinking, our consciousness depends. It is the very base of consciousness, of thinking about what are you thinking about? Well, it depends on what you've been conditioned to think about, and that depends on your ignorance. So you might start to see how these are then going to start to build up, that it is upon that very consciousness that there arises nama rupa, name and form, Michael the dude with the beard and the man bun, right? Nama rupa, the white board that is shaped like this and is that color. That's the name of it based on the form of it. Nama rupa. But Nama Rupa, this, this, um, uh, what Wittgenstein called the language game, the language game, Nama Rupa, depends on consciousness. Consciousness is, is playing the language game. You with me so far? So the idea is, is that it is upon that consciousness that there's this, ooh, look, a whiteboard. Ooh, look, a guy named Michael next to the whiteboard, Nama Rupa, right? It is upon that naming, right, that the six senses depend. Meaning, you first determine if that was a sound, a sight, a smell, and then it becomes an, a phenomena of the eye, a phenomena of the ear, nose, tongue, or body. So, this is an interesting twist for anybody that's like, um, you know, into oh my gosh there's so much going on here phenomenology ontology all kinds of stuff but if you're interested in it buddhism sees this kind of bubbling up and that there's this consciousness that is then nama rupa nama rupa nama rupa and then from the nama rupa you get eyeball sight phenomena ear sound phenomena so now we're at six senses, including the brain, thinking about stuff. And it is upon the senses, the body, the eyes, the ear, the nose, the tongue, it is upon those that contact, sparsha, depends. Contact, contact is bink, touching, coming into contact. The body comes into contact with whatever. The eye comes into contact with form. The sound comes into contact with sound. That's the contact. And it is only dependent upon contact that there arises a vedana, a sensation. A sensation of, ooh, you, or, mm, ah. So those, what I call reactions, Vedana, I like reactions rather than feeling or sensation. Feeling for me is too emotional and sensation actually kind of, well, it ignores that this is about the reaction. As the Buddha said, sort of negative, positive, or neutral. So these Vedana are, are about the quality of the feeling or sensation, which is about negative, positive, and neutral. And so these sensations about whether I, it's a pleasurable vision, a pleasurable vision, the sensation of a pleasurable vision is dependent upon contact, right? Where's a good prop, right? Here. Do you, do you like the, do you like the rainbow flag? Now, how do you feel about the rainbow flag? Well, I took it away from you. You're not, you don't have visual contact with it anymore. So because the contact, because contact's gone, no more sensations, no more craving, no more clinging. Yes, I'm foreshadowing. I'm, I like to do that every now and then, kind of like take a peek ahead. But the idea is, is that if you get rid of one of these, if you get rid of the base, the other one has nowhere to be. It can't be. If there's no consciousness, there's no nama rupa ing, no name forming, no name game, no language game going on. If there's no consciousness, no name game. If there's no contact, no sensations. And if there's no sensations, there's no tanha, craving, the wanting of it. This is so easy. This is so easy to understand. 
where, yeah, look, I've got a, I got a special box here. I got a, I got something in here. Do you want it? Do you want what's in the box? You, be careful, right? The idea is like, the idea is, is that you were supposed to say, well, I, I don't know what's in the box. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I want it or not. Cause I don't have, I'm not going on anything. So what's, this is profound. This is a, this is where we just stepped into the profound <laughs> where it's like, Oh my gosh, I can only have a desire for that, which I can conceive of, of that, which is well, that I have had a sensation of via contact, via my senses, which is a Namarupa game, via consciousness, based on conditioning, based on ignorance, right? But that idea that I couldn't even want it if I don't have the contact to give me the sensations. But then let's say I showed you what was in the box and you were like, yeah, bam. Upadana, upadana is the clinging. And the idea is, is that this ravenous clinging, and it doesn't have to be physical, of course, the mental one is the big problem. Uh, the concept of ownership, that one, that clinging, right? Well, that, that like ownership or ah, the clinging, upadana, we only do that for what we crave. We wouldn't do that to something we didn't crave. And we can only crave that which we have had sensations about based on contact, based on sensations, back down the chain, right? So now, if everybody's with me, we're gonna make this very interesting. We're gonna make this even more profound because this next link on the chain, which is bhava, B-H-A-V-A in Sanskrit, usually translated as essence, in the oldest version of this teaching, bhava or essence was actually basically an embryo, maybe just semen, maybe semen and egg, but they were actually talking about um, that you can't have birth without conception. And yes, again, I know that seems very obvious, <laughs> very simple in that way. And by conception, of course, it can happen in all kinds of ways, but you can't have a birthing experience without the bhava. That was the old way of teaching it. But we're in the Dharmadhatu tonight. We're so deep in the Dharmadhatu that what is really wonderful from a phenomenological, ontological, epistemological, all kinds of other logical ways, the Chinese for this link in the chain is simply being. Just being. And so what is so profound about this idea is that that something be, that it be, that something be is dependent upon the actual clinging to it, to, to be that. Stay that, stay that way, surface of the mirror, stay there. So it is upon the upadana that the very being itself the very thing itself essentially comes into being. And then once there's the being, now, now, now that there's being, there can be the birth of that being and the, then the death of that being. And if we're talking about an inanimate object, we can speak of its production and destruction. Production in a factory, destruction in a fire, whatever. But the idea of no object, the coming into being, i.e. the birth of the being, and then the destruction of the being, whether it's an inanimate object or me. 
So here it is in backwards order because the Tathagata, the Tathagata likes to do it that way. The, all the adjoining links in the circle of this in order from ignorance, conditioning, all the way up to old age and death, and then also in reverse order. So that's the next line. The next move on this is that you go back down the chain. And so we got to go back down the chain. This is the idea. And, and it's very important to go back down the chain because not understanding this is ignorance. So you worried about dying? I'm worried about death, old age, gray hairs. Well, here's the deal. The, the phenomena of death, of dying, only things that are born get to die. If something never comes into being, it can never go out of being. It's really that simple. If something is never born, it can never die. Now, if something is never born, right? Or this idea of the birth of something. Well, it, what are we talking about? What's born? Some, something, something needs to be born, some entity or the production of something, right? So right there is how we understand, oh, so there's this intimate thing being wrapped up in something being and then it coming from somewhere and going from somewhere. And where that notion of the being comes from is from the clinging. <laughs> and again, this is that subtle dharmic level that I was trying to get us to, which is this idea that phenomena as phenomena, pair of glasses, telephone, whatever it is, it as a thing, it as it, is not from this perspective a, a property of physics and molecules. It's actually the mind saying, be glasses. E hold on, you be glasses. That's the upadana. And of course, the reason why Michael might upadana out on these and, and be them and be them into existence is because I need them, I, or I tanha, I crave them. I don't see quite as well without them, and I would like to. <laughs> so there's the desire, and then therefore the glasses, right? And so the craving, the wanting to see better, that's very much a sensation problem, because I, I judge this blurry Vedana. I judge this blurry, <laughs> and that's, that's a sensation that produces this craving for not blurry, which needs these. And then I could lose them or destroy them, right? So, ooh, right, there they are. So, well, you could go all the way back down there. You just go all the way back down. And I'm not going to go all the way back down because I do only have a few more minutes to get through a little bit. Is everybody feeling okay on this dependent origination thing? Um, I would have like one or two comments. Um, can you move your head a little bit to the, yeah, okay. So um, what I'm thinking is, so real suffering comes actually in, I mean, the root is obviously ignorance, right? We've talked about this. Real suffering comes in when we are on the stage of craving, uh, clinging actually, right? So before that, um, do you hear me clearly or is my, okay. Um, so suffering comes in not sensation, not contact, uh, contact not six, six senses, but when we start clinging. This is right? Um, nope. and earlier? This is the mass of suffering. And what's actually wonderfully magical about this is you can take your pick. And okay. actually, you, if you jettison any one of these, the whole thing falls down like a house of cards. 
Yeah, but you know, like name and form, you know, mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm not aware of ignorance, if I'm not aware of it, right? When I'm in, in a sense of um, I label things and things come into form, but I'm not aware that this is basically Maya or illusion or um, then I'm not really suffering, right? Like for example, animals, they see stuff and I, I don't think that they really suffer or people that, not people, I don't want to be judgmental, but um, people that don't have this understanding don't necessarily um, suf see the suffering in the moment of when something takes a name or form. I know that suffering is involved in everything, but I feel like this real suffering what someone experiences is when, when we start with, with clinging and not necessarily earlier. Um, that was kind of a comment, question mark, question mark. Yep. I, it's, um, yeah, it's a really great question too. It, it affords me the opportunity to say this. It's a very interesting thing, Connie, about the, the clinging, uh, the, the thirst or the craving, because yeah, in the, in the Four Noble Truths, the, the kind of this original teaching of the Buddha, that's right. That clinging's the problem and you, get, you, you solve that one, it's, you're good in that sense of not suffering. But this 12 link chain of causation, even, even within the, the Theravada tradition, within all Buddhist traditions, this teaching is the pinnacle of understanding. This is, this is the limit of reality, as it's called. This is what's really going on. This is, this is it. And so what I'm saying is, is that from a certain perspective, the Four Noble Truths and clinging and detachment, that's kind of like self-help type stuff. That's just uh, some basic Buddhism. This is a much deeper insofar as it's cutting to the very, 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 well, it's not actually, this is a better way to say what I just said. The Four Noble Truths and Five Skandhas, that's about um, me, Michael, and my experience. This is about the whole universe world, where it comes from, where all phenomena comes from. If, if you understood what I was talking about with Dean's question about uh, knowing the minds of sentient beings is actually about understanding these principles, and Dean made the reference like, oh, that's a, you know, a psychologist who understands like these cues and stuff. And it's like, yeah, so that's about, that's about understanding, em emoting, yapping, crying, emotional sentient beings. Mm -hmm. This is understanding the entire world and where it comes from and how it comes to be, why it be and all of that. Mm -hmm. So this is a little, a little different and as a, just as a follow-up, Connie, to your question, I would just say, I really, we only know our own suffering, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, like any idea about whether others are suffering or why they're suffering or all of that, I think it's sort of you know, I, and I don't want to conflate the message about knowing the minds of all sentient beings with what I'm saying here. It, it's about sort of, I don't know, it's just sort of about this idea of, of, of knowing one's own suffering, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, I think where I'm coming from, we don't need to go deeper. I think where I'm coming from is like the clinging, this is so obvious this, that there is suffering that in my understanding and my experiences and what I'm seeing um, all around me, that the very clinging is, you know, as they say, then really the gateway of um, freedom or liberation or enlightenment or for me, the clinging jumps then to ignorance. And, and um, you know, there's this saying like, um, there needs to be clinging in order to, for there um, there is freedom. So mm. there needs to be a sense of freedom in order to understand uh, clinging. So we understand there is something such as liberation. So that's I think why I'm so focused on the on the stage of clinging, I guess. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, just just a comment. So yeah, great thank comment. You. And I would. 
Kanye, just encourage you to meditate just for a little bit on that idea of actually you could get rid of any one of these and it would result in the same thing. And I think going through them one by one and kind of being like, oh, interesting. Mm. Oh, interesting. Like, you know, and not in any kind of like, I must understand why Michael said that if I get rid of this, it'll, you know, it's not about that. It's sort of just this like, because that's the teaching about this. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a little bit more of the story that I'd love to try to do. Everybody good though? I have a question. Yeah, man. Oh, hey. um, so, uh, it's related to the bhava uh, concept. Um, you were speaking about like uh, be being, being born, this kind of thing. And I just wanted to get your input on something I read recently in um, a Theravadan book uh, called Clearing the Path. Um, there, uh, it's basically just a kind of commentary by this guy in the 1960s. Uh, who became a monk, uh, an Englishman who became a monk, and his his insight. And he said something like, um, "I will, ne I can never die because I was never born." And this is, I think, related to like not self, right? Because there's not, um, if there is no self, then there's no, there's no birth or death. Right. I mean, um, I mean, that's how he was kind of I'm, I'm meshing what he said with my own insight in meditation. And so I just was wondering if you could maybe expound on uh, the, the, the Baba that you're speaking of um, yep. in relation to this idea of not self. It's uh, um, are you serious? Because you're like segueing this so perfectly into the next section that even me answering this question is like way too perfect. So thank, so thank you. Yeah. Um, no but be, but because I don't want to spend too long on it, I will give you a kind of a one of those lightning uh, vidyaprapta answers. It, I would suggest thinking about it. Uh, it's about identity, identification, like what one identifies with. And I've mentioned this in so many of my Dharma talks with this idea that like, you know, that if you identify with your job, then losing your job can be pretty devastating on an existential level because I, I identified with my occupation and I'm no longer that, right? And then if I, if I identified with being a husband, but then I got divorced, it'd be like, oh, but I'm not, I'm not who I, am <laughs> you know you get into all of that right and so rather than going too deep on the emptiness no self idea just just sort of like put on the idea of no self as in maybe myself are actually all of these identifications my occupation my marital status my gender my race all of these identifying with this, and now let's take it really crazy, identifying with the body. And what the Buddha is sort of saying, or what this, is, what this message is kind of saying is, is that if you identify with the, the body, I got bad news for you. But if you identify with enlightened wisdom, <laughs> if you identify with bodhi, and you become bodhisattva, a being of enlightenment, and identify with that, well, they say they're, it, it, all bets are off, is what they say. So just that, just that little idea of identifying, and, you know, take it for what it's worth. But there's a better answer. So if these links in the circle of, the 12 links in the circle of, dependent origination, in order from ignorance all the way up to old age and death and also in reverse order, all 12 links do not think of each other, nor are they aware of each other. 
all these things are inapprehensible by nature. They have no activities, no thought, no eye, no mind. Each link is pure in its basic nature and does not know of the other links in the chain. Yet ordinary people, being ignorant of this doctrine, insist that nama rupa, or just the form, insist that form is the self, that the self has this kind of form, and that that form belongs to the self, and they hold the same view about their sensations, conditioning, or sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. Because they cling to the I and the mine, they give rise to the four wrong views. So before we do the four wrong views, lightning fast, crazy fast, that was another way of answering the same question that you just had. That's the two different, you know, two different answers to that. This sutra did the beautiful thing where it, it dropped this idea of the four wrong views a while ago. And you were supposed to be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are the four wrong views? Well, in classic sutra fashion, you are not, you know, not let down. That because sentient beings cling to the I and the mind, they give rise to the four wrong views. They take the impermanent to be permanent. They take suffering to be joy. They take impurity to be purity. And they take egolessness or no self anatman to be the self. And because of their wrong views, they get all confused by ignorance and fail to think correctly. They allow their minds to be defiled and cannot break through the defilements. They are fettered by their craving for existence and thus continually circle in samsara. The wise, because they have deep insight into all phenomena, they see no self, no other, no sentient beings, no life, no birth, no old age, illness, or death. They do not see any bondage or any killing. Vijaprapta, when the butcher named Horrible heard the voice of, Tathagata, of the Tathagata teaching the Dharma from a distance, he was suddenly enlightened and his intention to kill ceased at once. Casting aside his knife, he came up out of the pit, went to the Buddha, bowed at his feet, he withdrew to one side and said to the Buddha world, honored one, I wish to leave this household life and seek the path and to seek the Buddha Dharma. The Buddha said, very good, welcome monk. And the butcher immediately became a fully ordained shramana. Then Tathagata born victorious, knowing the butcher's mind was gradually coming to maturity, extensively explained the practices of a bodhisattva for him. And after hearing them, horrible, attained the realization of the non-arising of all dharmas and never afterwards regressed from the Buddha Dharma. And as for the cow, as for the cow, it enjoyed hearing the wonderful voice of the Tathagata expounding the doctrine of dependent origination. <laughs> oh my gosh. Consequently, after death, it was reborn in the Tushita heaven, where it saw the future Buddha Maitreya and attained correct faith. <laughs> Vijaprapta, the activities of sentient beings are very, very complicated. <laughs> very subtle and very difficult to recognize and understand. Therefore, Vijaprapta, bodhisattvas in pursuit of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment, should try to know thoroughly the capacities and actions of sentient beings. They should keep an impartial and unobstructed mind towards all beings and be detached from all dharmas. Dot, dot, dot.
Uh, and that's 8.30, by the way, the last ellipses there, the last three dots. It's actually a beautiful little teaching on the six paramitas. I have no idea why they didn't put it in. It's a beautiful little thing, just about the six paramitas. But, but anyways, folks, that's it. That's the eh, treasury of an equal amount of afflictions there. Um, very rich. Uh, so rich, in fact, that I didn't really even do my notes. I just read the sutra and tried to explain it. I had so many tangents. <laughs> so that's just, those are just going to have to wait for another time. And so next Sunday, folks, tune in for when we open the fifth and final hidden treasury of the practices of the Bodhisattva. Thank you, Michael. Thank, Thank you. you. I hope that wasn't too much. Just all of dependent origination in 20 minutes. No, it was totally great. No. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have a couple announcements, folks, from our side, um, from the SF Dharma Collective, which I think you all know. Maybe you don't. I don't know if anyone's here for the first time. Um, if you are, the San Francisco Dharma Collective is run entirely by student volunteers um, who give freely of their time into the collective to create this space where uh, teachers and students can meet. And so if you'd like, um, you're welcome and invited to offer Donna into the collective. Um, if you'd like to liberate yourself from any craving or clinging you have to your own money. Um, and you know, I, I say that jokingly, but Donna is actually like, you can do it as a liberation practice. Um, and if you wanna do that, pay like a lot of attention to how it feels to give into something you believe in giving to. And um, that in and of itself can be very liberating. So urge you to try that. There are links in the chat. Um, and we also have started a series on Tuesday nights um, around the theme of wise action that grew out of conversations we were having amongst ourselves, given the unprecedented time that we're living in about what we as meditators can do, um, both in our internal and in our external work in this moment to kind of balance those things. And we were talking about it amongst the students and we thought, well, we have all of these teachers, why don't we ask them? Uh, so we have a series, MC Owens is speaking at it uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, and this Tuesday we have Tig O'Malley speaking about the role of anger in wise action. Um, it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, so join us for that. There's a link to register to that in the chat. I don't know where the chat is for y'all. Um, and then you can see more of uh, Michael at his website, Lotus Underground. He does private teaching. Um, if you want to know more about that, you can ask Jaswal because Jaswal has been sending me like chats, uh, like talking about how great it is to study with you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, unsolicited testimonials, uh, always a good sign. Uh, and I think that's all uh, from, from us at the collective. So, Michael, thank you. Looking forward to next week already. Thanks, Katie. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thanks.